Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, another installment of Beer School. My name is Andrew Mason, a.k.a. Brewer A, and uh, joining me this week is Stan Hieronymus, a journalist, book author, blogger, writer, uh, extraordinaire. Um, he has written a number of books specifically about brewing, including um, Brew Like a Monk, um, Brewing with Wheat, uh, for the love of hops, and most recently, brewing local, uh, focusing on locally sourced ingredients. Um, and let's see if we if we got our commands working here. Oh, let me bring up our let me bring up Ankbot real quick. I forgot to open that, and you can uh, hit a command here and double check on Stan's information. Do we get it? Come on, Ankbot. Don't fail me now. It's loading up. We'll get back to it. <clears throat> anyway, um, I will make sure that works so that you can find Stan's uh, blog and his books um, very easily. He's written some great books. As I mentioned, um, at the end of last stream, uh, For the Love of Hops, the Practical Guide to Aroma, Bitterness, and the Culture of Hops. And kind of on a whim at the end of that last stream, I had mentioned, you know, it's harvest time. Maybe we can um, talk about hops next week, and maybe we can get uh, Stan to come on the show. And sure enough, I sent him an email, and he was um, uh, gracious enough to come join us. So why won't Ankbot be? All right, we'll worry about it later, uh, but we, we'll get that going. But Stan, thank you again for joining us, and uh, we're going to take pleasure. we're going to take a deep dive um, into hops today. We've talked about hops briefly um, in the beer 101 show when we talked about the four main ingredients of hops, but um, because it is harvest time, um, I thought what better what better topic to discuss than one of uh, one of my favorite ingredients in beer, hops. Um, Stan, thanks again for joining us. If uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about yourself. Oh, we we don't want to spend a lot of time talking about me because <laughs> a lot of hops to talk about. Um, I, I the, the one quick thing uh, since you're there in northern Illinois or northern Indiana is I grew up in central Illinois in the middle of beans and corn, so I come from agriculture. I appreciate agriculture. Um, and that's probably one of the things that cemented my relationship and a hot horse. And uh, again, chat as always. If you um, if you notice any technical issues, please let me know in uh, in chat, and I will try to jump on those right away because it wouldn't be a live stream without some type of technical problem. So, um, first of all, um, we've talked briefly before about um, what hops are. They are the flowering cone of a climbing vine and they've been used for brewing for hundreds of hundreds of years but Stan, um what what made hops um what made hops the preferred bittering agent for beer as we know it today well i i, I think an important thing to look at because right now with the uh uh how much people are falling in love with New England IPAs and falling out of love with bitterness um, is to consider all the things that hops bring to the table for beer. Uh, bitterness remains very important. Obviously, we love the aroma, what the aroma contributes to flavor. Um, we don't want to forget about mouthfeel, um, but they are antimicrobial and uh, they add flavor stability, and that's what allowed hops to become an industrial product, something that is uh, sold and distributed wi widely. Uh, you know, before that, 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 hops had to be, I mean, beer had to be higher alcohol in order not to turn sour immediately. 
So uh, yeah, if you go back in history, hops have been around, as you pointed out, for a, a couple thousand years at least, used in beer. Um, it's more into the ninth century before we know that hops are used in beer as a flavoring agent. But it's not until about 1150 that somebody, and, and this is not documented at all, other than no, in, until it's discussed in 1150, that, oh, we boil with the hops, that's what makes a difference in beer. And it's more like about 1300 before people begin using hops in beer and ship beer around. So now beer can have less alcohol in it to preserve it for it can be produced at a lower cost and people can afford to buy it. And at that point, uh, beer gets more widely distributed. Um, another thing that we haven't talked about, that I haven't mentioned in terms of hops is what they bring in terms of foam and lacing. So when I talk to home brewers who, who know um, the BJCP scoring uh, guidelines, and you can jump in anytime, <laughs> Andrew would go, this guy's awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, BJCP's scoring is 50-point scale, which is basically what rate beer uses as well, your advocate, is 12 points for aroma, three for appearance, 20 for flavor, uh, then five for uh, mouthfeel, and then 10 for made up how I feel about it. So what the Poles have done, because the Polish home brewers wanted to emulate this but not make it exactly like that, they looked at it and said they're only giving 6% of the score to what the beer looks like. So they still give 12 for aroma. They give three for color, but they give six for foam and lace and that that really shows you what what importance of hops they also give six for quality of bitterness so that 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 brings hops much more to the fore thinking about what it contributes to the beer now i don't know how you talk about quality of bitterness but it's really something important to think about and, um, and so for those sir, of you that don't know uh, bjcp is the um, guidelines uh, for yeah, beer essentially judge certification program that's used most frequently for homebrew contests and some. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I'm honestly I don't refer to BJCP all that often. I most frequently refer to the Brewers Association guidelines for uh, Great American Beer Cup and for World Beer Cup. But BJCP is used um, most commonly for homebrewing competitions and then um, I don't know. Would you say? Uh, smaller competitions, or um, it, does it have a more international um, um, usage than I'm familiar with? Maybe it's certainly at an international level. It's its influence, as I had pointed out, in the in the uh, Polish competitions. Mm -hmm. um, headed to South America right after GABF, and those will be JCP uh, judged as well as influencing uh, uh, beer in South Africa there in Australia, New Zealand, and so on. So it is those style guidelines people are paying attention to. Um, but even in terms of thinking about bringing numbers to what you think of beer, uh, as I said, it's uh, to me, rate beer is totally based on that. I think your advocate is based, basically based on that. When people put numbers to beer, they are referring to what the BJCP has set forward. So, so yeah, so for hops, we're getting, um, we're getting bitterness, we're getting flavor, we're getting aroma, but we're also getting um, uh, lacing and appearance, and really it's touching uh, nearly every aspect of the finished product. Right, and the part that, which people don't necessarily think about from a brewer standpoint, it is, you know, that, that you're able to deliver a product that isn't sour four days down the road. Yes, that's, uh, that is intentionally uh not unintentionally sour four days down the road right yeah <laughs> we don't we don't need to fall down the rabbit hole of sourness versus intentional funk or anything else but um so um so let's go over um where are hops grown in the world because the list seems to be growing by the day um so it, it, it's important to realize that 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 
hops are uh, date length dependent. So they, they can grow between about the 35th and 55th uh, parallel latitude, that's either north of the equator or south of the equator. There, there are very few opportunities south of the equator for them to grow um, because generally they're going to be too close to the equator. So to be economical to grow, um, then uh, they need to be farther away. Um, so at, at the point people said, I can grow hops, I can make money, then distance from the equator became a factor. Uh, that's why uh, in North America, it's really hard to grow hops in North Carolina or in Missouri. Um, it's much easier in the Northwest. Uh, it, it works okay in the upper Midwest, in the upper parts of New York, but there they have other issues with humidity, uh, the amount of rain, and then uh, disease issues. So, so that's the other factor. Uh, that's why we have certain areas uh, of the world where hops were established. Once they're established in those areas, you have the other factor, which is they are expensive to harvest. They are using equipment that, that, you, that has only one use. Um, so there's six weeks out of the year, and the rest of the time that, that equipment is just sitting there dormant. And um, in just a little bit, we'll get into growing and harvesting. And uh, I have lots of pictures that we can look at um, from previous harvests and also from um, I just spent a week out in Yakima um, uh, earlier this month. Um, so we can get into some details about that. But hops are a no notoriously finicky plant to grow. Um, not only do they need the certain amount of day uh, day length that Stan had already mentioned, but the pressures that on them, um, different types of mildew. Um, mites and other pests, and um, this year, which um, I had I saw for the first time, and many people in the Yakima Valley saw for the first time, there was not a uh, particularly hard frost last year, and um, the rodent population, mouse and voles specifically, um, in Moxie, which is one town in the Yakima Valley which grows a lot of hops, um, had a voracious vole population and they were ravaging certain fields of hops and you would drive by and you would just see certain poles that were had brown in patches because the voles were eating the uh, base of the rhizome where they were coming out of the ground and it kills the entire length of the plant. And um, one grower specifically had a poster that said they were looking at somewhere in about a million dollars worth of damage for a certain variety. So um, that's a, certainly an odd one but a, a, a pretty interesting anecdote. And then along with that, um, some of the guys had said the hawks were so fat from eating voles and mice this year that they were having trouble flying because they there were so many of them. <laughs> they would sit on the poles in the hop fields and they would jump off to fly and they looked like they were going to hit the ground because they were that fat. So pretty unusual. But um, but yeah, apart even if you have ideal growing conditions, which many people would consider the Yakima Valley ideal growing conditions, um, you still have all kinds of problems. Um, and Yakima works really well and, in fact, grows somewhere around 75% of all of the world's hops now um, because... That's 75% of the hops in the United States. In the United States. Uh, okay. Uh but uh, a huge, a huge portion, and, and but seventy five percent of the hops grown in the United States. Um, I don't know what portion of that is for the worldwide entire volume of hops, but it still represents. A... Yeah, the United States grows a little bit. First of all, we take China out of the equation because they don't trade hops; mm -hmm. they only grow for themselves and they buy hops. Um, so you take that out. That Germany is a little bit more than the United States in terms of uh, alpha production which is the way we generally still measure hops. And so the United States is about half of that. And uh, then uh, Yakima Valley is about three quarters of the United States. Um, but the reason that Yakima works so well is that I, although it's a desert, um, the Yakima Valley is a um, extremely productive um, growing region, second only, I think, to California Central Valley. And they can um, control the amount of water generally speaking, that the hops get throughout the year so that they can um, eliminate some of the variables in terms of uh, in terms of growth. Right. Right. They, they had 
a, a great snowfall last winter, and that's something that people will care about hops. Uh, this winter, we'll be looking to see what kind of uh, snow are in the mountains above Yakima. So some of the major growing regions in the world for hops, um, Yakima Valley, there's some grown um, in Oregon State and some in Idaho. Um, not a ton, but they're, they're definitely there. And then, of course, you can get into um, discussions about the quality from those regions, too. But they are grown there. Um, and then um, once upon a time, they grew hops in parts of Wisconsin, correct? Correct. Um, and then also um, upstate New York. And right. uh, currently, there are some being grown in um, Michigan of some... A lot more than some in Michigan. In, Michigan of, of some soon... volume, yeah. Right. Michigan soon will grow more hops than New Zealand, which which is um, which is very interesting. Um, but then if you follow that line um, across uh, across the globe, you get um, southern England, Kent specifically. Um, you get um, the Hollertau region of Germany that goes right through essentially the middle of Germany, uh, Alsace region of France, um, the Czech Republic in Bohemia, uh, Slovenia and Am I missing any other major European growers? Uh, well, at Tetnang region okay. of Germany. Certainly, yes. Which is, and, and then north of the Hallertau, the uh, Elba Saab region mm -hmm. grows a lot of um, Alpha. Uh, but yeah, Germany, a big grower, um, Czech Republic, Slovenia, and... Um... Po Poland, um, you know, they, they, they continue to shrink. But Poland okay. still grows a significant amount. Um, and then, as we said, China grows hops, but they're all for China's consumption. And they're mainly making industrial lagers in China anyway. They're not really growing right. hops so much for aroma or flavor like most, like what right. many brewers in the U.S. are interested in. Um, <clears throat> and then if you follow that mirrored latitudinal line, um, there are hops that are grown in Australia and on the southern island of New Zealand. Yes. Do you, do you concur? Yes. Okay. <laughs> just, I was just making sure. Okay. So, um, but most are grown in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't, I actually don't really know uh, Australia's volumes off the top of my head. Uh, hey, uh, Australia is bigger than New Zealand and Australia is committed to growing more hops. Mm -hmm. um, and are they growing? Um, I know they're growing a lot of Galaxy, but I don't know what other varieties um that they're they're cultivating they, they're yeah, well uh, of course the uh, galaxy they continue to to amp those a lot um and uh enigma is another one upcoming okay uh, so that they 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 want to continue i, I mean they're, they're they are basically a subset of barth oz okay um, yeah you know so they they recognize right now there's a a lot of interest in what we refer to as aroma. Yeah. And people will, will pay a premium for aroma and therefore they want to deliver. So I guess we should explain um, for those that uh, are not as aware, um, hops typically are broken into two major categories. One is uh, alpha, which essentially are just are bittering hops. And that's treated almost like a commodity or is treated as a commodity by many people where you have... Um, a crop and it has a certain amount of alpha and um, much of that is not even used in any kind of plant form. It gets converted into a, uh, a syrup or an alpha extract um, and those are used for bittering across uh, industrial brewers or I mean we use alpha extract in our brewery too. Um, but it's, it's many people would not even care what variety it is. It's just um, bittering for alpha. a number it's alpha for a number it doesn't matter where it comes from you're growing a hop so that it has the most potential bitterness that you can get out of it as possible so that you can yield the most alpha per acre or hectare um, as you grow your hops um, but then the other major family which many most american brewers are uh, interested in are aroma or flavor hops and that's what's driving um, our segment of the industry to be, I think, more involved in the agricultural part of the of, of growing hops, which in many years previous, we have either been shut out of or have not really had as much of a voice in.
I'll keep waiting for you to jump in, Stan. But I, I oh no, okay. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I I think the big part there is you look at um, you know we're now ten years beyond what what's referred to as the uh, uh, hot prices, where where hot prices went flying up. Um, and at, at that point, there was a lack of alpha. And, and so uh, breweries around the world who who produce most of those industrial lagers that you don't really taste hops in at all, but it's an important product. Yeah. So, that, that, so that they are using um, two to three ounces of hops per 31 gallons per barrel, as opposed to an American craft or on average, they use um, 24 ounces per barrel. That's on average. Uh, and, and American IPA, dry hopped American IPA, is going to be between 60 and 120 ounces per 31 gallons. So that really changes. When you think about the volume involved, it's, it's an immense difference. Well, in 2007, People couldn't get the alpha. They would buy all those other hops. They would buy Oz hops, which they couldn't. Uh, but they would buy Cascade hops um, and just turn those into alpha. So, so we had this immense shortage. So by 2008, we had all these acres come on. And, and at the time, uh, so the United States, the, the groups in the Northwest, probably 70 to 80% of the hops they grew were, quote, alpha hops. Now, what they grow is 60 and 70 percent aroma. That's how much the market is put inside of two years. It's a major change, and there's been a lot of um, a lot of push to get um, brewers our size and in our segment to get on what would be more traditional contracting practices, where um, you have a reasonable idea of how much beer you're going to make in a year. You have a reasonable idea of how many hops you would need to make that beer in a year. And so you sign a contract for X amount of pounds for certain varieties. And then um, you would make up, uh, let's say you would contract, the rule of thumb was 80%. And then you would make up the remainder 20% on the spot market. So you would make sure that you have 80% of your hops secured. And then um, as years would go by, you would either... Um, make up the 20% and maybe the price would be better and you'd maybe buy a little bit more or maybe you'd buy a little bit less. But what a lot of people are running into is there was um, an incredible amount of growth for a lot of breweries in our segment and they committed to buying extreme poundage of hops and they were contracted so long now that things are slowing down for some breweries that they are finding themselves in a lot of trouble because they have committed to millions of dollars of hops and they don't necessarily have the need for them now. So um, what you're seeing now is a lot of people trying to um, restructure contracts or sell hops on secondary markets. And so um, things are very interesting right now, but um, let's, uh, let's jump back into um, a little bit more about being grown and processed because a lot of this is actually really important. Um, I we've looked at some of these pictures before, but let me bring these back up. Uh, let's see how well this is going to work. Here we go. So uh, this is a uh, cross section of a brewer's cut of hops. Um, so when you um, when you go out to selection, uh, probably in the Yakima Valley for most of the people in the U.S. Um, you are typically presented with some version of this. Excuse me. So um, these are a whole bunch of different cuts from baled hops, um, and they are uh, supposed to be a representation of a certain lot. And a lot is usually somewhere around um, ten to 15,000 pounds of hops. And the purveyor is giving these to you as a representation of what that volume of hops should be to fill your contracts that, um, with, that you've agreed to buy these hops in advance. And so um, you go around, and depending on the variety that you um, are picking uh, or that you're filling your contracts for, these ones you can see say Centennial on them. Um, you have all of these different lots of Centennial, and then you go through and evaluate um, usually by 
uh, rubbing and doing a sniff and trying to pick out what either is um, the most true to variety for you or um, maybe what hop would fill um, uh, would be most true to brand if you have a beer that has a specific characteristic to it. Um, so um, here is a picture of a truck uh, with a whole bunch of cut hops in the back of the truck. Um, and then actually, you know what, let me jump, let me jump to a field before we get to the processing. That might make a little bit more sense. Let me open one more right here. So um, I think that the hop processing is uh, super interesting because um, it's different. Every farm that you go to, everybody has a different way of processing and everybody has a different way of um, of harvesting and let's see, how about, here we go. Okay, so this is a field of hops. Um, so hops are grown um, on these uh, about 20 foot tall strings. Is 20, 20 sound like a reasonable number? That's in Yakima, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, in other parts of the world, maybe different sizes? Yeah, you're gonna be in Germany, it's gonna be seven meters. Okay. So that's, more like 23 feet, except in Tetanang, where it's eight meters. Okay. Um, and so uh, these are hops growing in the field. And I'll, um, you can see the, the cones on the vine, or the vine right here, rather. Um, and let me jump forward. I've got a lot of pictures from Harvest this year. So um, I was touring around with um, SS Steiner, which is a, a, a big hop purveyor. And they have a unique way of harvesting where they um, have a, a, combina a combi harvester, basically. So whereas um, a very traditional way of harvesting and processing hops is to um, have a, uh, a tractor go through, um, cut the bottom of the binds, and then have another truck come through and cut the tops and lay them into a truck and then take that entire volume back to the processing facility, um, what Steiner does is um, they have a combination harvester. So as it's coming out of the field, it's already essentially starting to get picked. So they have these um, uh, trucks that they manufacture for themselves. Here's the, the uh, tractor with the, uh, the bottom cutter on it coming through, and it cuts the, cuts the bottoms to free them so that they're basically just um, hanging only from the top at that point, and uh, slices the bottoms. And then the harvester comes through and slices the top. And as it's getting pulled through that big orange um, harvester right there, there's like fingers inside of it that knocks uh, the cones off and strips most of the vegetation out. And that gets dumped out um, into the field as mulch. So it's, they don't even take all that stuff back with them. Um, so this is getting fed in and there's a couple people here operating it. And then there's this truck here and their system um, with this um, harvesting, they say holds something like five times as much um, uh, cone volume and hop volume as, to take back to their processing and separation facility that you would find in a more traditional way of, of, uh, of harvesting. And then this is what a, an empty field looks like once it's harvested. So as we jump forward here, this is uh, my coworker, Caitlin, uh, our, the, our head of sensory. I have a bunch of videos. Oh, let me go. This might be easier if I jump back to the other pictures now. Here, let's do this. All right, so this is a more traditional way of doing it. So here's the truck with the, um, the cut binds, and they're going to get loaded up. Um, in this case, there's a, like a rail system, um, and they get fed on and pulled up along this giant rail and fed into the, uh, the picker portion of it. And uh, this uh, picker right here has big metal fingers that spins around and knocks the hops off and there's a conveyor on the bottom of here and then as the cones come off um, it's also knocking off leaves and other vegetative matter and that all has to be separated because brewers don't want to buy stems and seeds and everything else they want to buy hops so they have these um, what are called uh, dribble trays right dribble trays right so the dribble trays are successive conveyors that are on an angle and um, they move at a certain speed and because the hops um, roll and because they are a different size and um, 
uh, and density than the other material, um, they'll fall down the trays and then all the other leaves and everything get separated out. And this is done over and over and over again to try to clean everything up as they go into the kilns. Um, and then real quick in chat, um, Shoot asks, how long does a typical hop take to mature from, from growth to harvest? So when do, when do hops usually get strung up? I guess it's going to be different in different parts of the world, but um, as the rhizomes start to um, poke through the ground, when do they um, actually get strung up on the strings? Well, in, in Yakima, they're, you're going to start training them. Um, it, it depends upon the variety. Some of them will wrap around that string almost on their own. Mm -hmm. Some are pretty persnickety. Centennial would be an example. And so you, somebody has to come through with their hand and wrap them around the string. And that's going to start in May. And so you expect um, those hops to hit the top um, by the solstice. Uh, and that then they're really going to develop the cones after that. But those last few weeks before harvest, are really when they develop, uh, the lupulin comes out, and the oil. So in within a few days, that litter, that that's what really changes the hop, and, and that's one thing that people are only beginning to figure out now. Yeah, and we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more um, a little bit later because when you get to the um, when you get to selection and you have a whole bunch of different lots of the same variety, sometimes it's incredible the variety that can be in front of you when it's essentially all the same hop. The characteristics can be off the charts. So, um, so hops. Uh, so as they get, they get separated um, in the plant, and um, then they need to be dried out because um, they have a lot of water in the cones, and um, they they're about eighty percent moisture when they go into that kiln. Yeah, so we need to take that moisture level down to about 11%, something right around there. So that's a lot of, um, so when you walk into a kiln, the first thing that happens is, I think you're blown away by the aroma because it's it's overwhelming. And then number two, it feels like you're walking into a hop sauna because the air is yeah. completely saturated um, with humidity because they have these enormous um, horsepower burners that are blowing hot air up through the bottoms of these beds um, to try to drive out the moisture. And so the hops come in and they get um, pushed in these kiln beds and there's um, uh, an arm that uh, feeds them evenly uh, across the bed. And then let me jump back to the other pictures too from this new one, this new new season of hops. I've got some cool, cool stuff in there. Let's see. I have some movies, but I wasn't getting the movies to work. So, um, so these there's um, there's a canvas or muslin or some type of um, material in the bottoms of the beds, and then <clears throat> if you look closely in uh, the bottom of this bed, you can see that there are um, basically little holes in the stainless steel in here, and that's actually very important because the um, the the size and the dis the the size of the holes and how far apart they are controls how much um, air goes through and how evenly they get um, uh, dried out. And that ends up being very important because you want to dry the hops out evenly, but you also don't want to do it too fast or too slowly. Um, you want to have it done in a certain amount of time, especially if you're trying to um, uh, make sure that you're not volatilizing or driving off uh, aromas and flavors for aroma varieties. So beautiful, long, uh, green beds of hops. Um, uh, uh, one thing I point out here, this, this is a system, this is the U.S. way of doing things. Certainly, yes. Right. Always the caveat. It's, it's, it's not the way hops are dried in Germany, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's not the way hops are dried in the Czech Republic. Uh, so that everybody has their own way of doing it and, and their own way of preserving potentially more odor compounds, which eventually to a certain So the U.S. way, um, once the hops are um, dried to a very specific moisture content, um, those uh, the, the fabric that's on the bottom of the bed has eyes on it, and they get connected to here, and they get rolled up on this tube, and they go down to this conveyor to the cooling floor. 
So once you get down to the cooling floor, you have these um, really large mountains of hops, which is always really fun to see. Um, and then from here, they, uh, depending on the processor, um, some people would bail them um, from this point um, and then send them to coolers uh, because the other really important part here is that uh, the reason the moisture is one of the other reasons that the moisture is so important is that if hops get too dry, they will spontaneously combust and um, they have spontaneously combusted and cause big, extremely dangerous fires. And the higher um, uh, oil content uh, and the typically the higher alpha varieties are the ones that they're they're most worried about um, catching things on fire, um, which is super scary. So um, the uh, almost every purveyor that you go to will have people checking hop bales 24 hours a day um, with um, a uh, some type of humidity or a density meter to, to check the percentage of, uh, of, uh, of wetness in the hops, but then also um, radar guns. And then um, the USDA is also on site when the bales come in to the coolers to do their own uh, third party testing to check on things. And then um, some purveyors um, will bale the hops and then pelletize them. And then um, one in particular doesn't even do the baling. In most cases, they will take these hops straight uh, from this cone form and put them through a hammer mill and pelletize them right away. So everybody has a little bit of a different way of processing stuff. And then from here, let's see, let's go back to the bales. So. This is a, these are bales of hops. Uh, so these are typically about 200 pounds, I wanna say. Uh, 200 pounds. Yeah, 200 pounds. They're supposed to be. 200 pound bales. Um, and so they drive around with these really cool forklifts that have special um, attachments on them to squeeze, uh, like you'll see dudes squeezing like two hop, two, two hop bales vertically and one on the top and doing all this like fancy forklift truck driving. But, um, uh, many, um, many people, many uh, hop growers or processors will store these bales um, in uh, coolers until their pelletization plant is free. So um, many, uh, most hops are not going to be pelletized right away. Most are going to sit in a cooler for uh, any number of months until they get processed. Um, so this is the form that they're in for quite a while for most places. And then to get them in those bales, they, uh, this is a picture of a baler. So they're it's a, a vertical, um, basically a hydraulic press that um, drops, uh, basic, should be 200 pounds of hops into here, pushes it down into that square format. And then um, as they are lifted up, um, the uh, canvas bags, or in most cases now, they're not, I don't even think they're using canvas or using some kind of poly bag, uh, but they get, they get sewn up and then uh, go on their way from there. But they have, um, you'll, as you're driving around the Yakima Valley, you'll see trucks with hops on them and you'll know right away what's on them because they are uh, stamped with a variety and then they have all kinds of other um, lot information and, and other details to them. So, um, so that's how they're grown and processed. And then uh, from here, uh, so from the bales, um, when they do end up going to a pelletization plant, um, they get pushed through a hammer mill um, to make them into a fine powder and then they get pushed through dyes to make them into like little what look like little uh, rabbit food pellets and those are uh, in most brewers opinions the easiest way to handle them and the easiest way to, to use them in the brewery setting um, some breweries are set up to use whole cone hops um, but it is uh, it's I, in my opinion, it's pretty rare to see that there are some breweries that are specifically set up to use whole cone hops um, all the time. Um, but it's uh, you really need special equipment, and it's really a, kind of a giant pain in the ass to store bales of hops like this in your brewery and then to haul them out and to use them. Even a mini bale, um, which it would be a fraction of this, is, is still a giant pain in the ass to use. So uh, most brewers are using either pelletized hops or some other type of downstream product. And then um, as we talked about different um, processing, uh, this is a Peralt picker, which is um, a newer generation. Uh, the Peralt family is a, you can jump in at any time, Stan, because uh, you probably know more than I do, but the Peralt family is a legacy hop growing and processing family in the Yakima Valley. And um, they, uh, oh, thank you for the host, Chewy. Um, 
they uh, have their own um, equipment that they designed, and this is the front end of their picker. So um, instead of the Steiner picker that we saw in the field, which is like a combination harvester, or that other one that we looked at, which was a more traditional style, um, which I think was a wolf picker or a Donhauer processing facility. Um, this is the, it was a Donhauer. Okay. Uh, so this, a- this is the Peralt um, version. So this is a... Uh, a newer generation of it where they have this like basically a big ass saw on the front end that, right. that saws everything up into um, much smaller pieces uh, before it starts to clean and separate everything. And so that this is what it looks like coming out. So instead of being in long strings, everything's kind of like Ginsu knifed into much smaller parts. And then it goes through the cleaning of the dribble trays and, separation and then as it comes out more uh as you get farther down you can see it's mostly cones and much less other vegetal matter all right so that's growing and processing so um we talked a little bit about bittering um in terms of how hops are used in brewing but uh how about um how are hops being used now what are some, um, I mean, we don't need to get super deep into technique, but um, maybe just cover some basics on um, when you're actually making beer, what's the difference between putting a certain hop variety in at the beginning of uh, a, a batch of beer versus the end or um, uh, dry hopping? And let's touch on some of those basics real quick. But in terms of bittering, uh, what you're doing is you're adding, adding hops during the boil uh, because it needs heat to what we refer to uh, as isomerization. And that converts um, the, the alpha acids into isomerized alpha acids, and that's when they become bitter. The alpha acids themselves are not bitter. Isomera, isomerized, they are bitter. Um, and they add that balance to the sweetness of, of malt, of, of barley malt. And, and that's what makes a nicely balanced beer. So we went through a period uh, throughout most of the 20th century where we reduced bitterness in beer. So by the time you got to uh, Sierra Nevada making beer, uh, beer was mostly uh, insipid, but insipid on the side of sweetness. There was not much balancing bitterness at all. So people go, wow, we've got this bitterness. And, and in the next, so we'll, we'll say that happens in about 1980. And in the next 15 to 20 plus years, people got excited about bitterness. So we, we had the advent of IPAs and beer became more and more and more bitter. Um, and so people mostly talked about bitterness. And that was just adding more hops at the beginning. As this can shift, thinking more about uh, the aroma, because when you boil those hops, you eliminate the odor compounds that create the odor compounds that create aroma. Yeah, it's just um, like it's just like making a dish at home. Like if you're going to be making mm-hmm. if you're going to be making a dish at home, and you add all of your aromatic spices right at the beginning, they're all going to be volatilized off by the time you're done making your dish, and it's not going to be very aromatic. Right. Exactly. Ten minutes of boiling eliminates fifty percent of of odor compounds. Yeah. So the hops that um so the hops that you're going to be using at the beginning of your boil, um are. Uh, mainly for bittering. And like we said before, um, in many cases, uh, depending on your brewing philosophy and the length of your the boil of your beer, um, many people don't even care what type of hop that is. It's just, uh, it's a number. It's bittering. It doesn't matter really what the variety is. It's just what the alpha acid is so that you can do your calculation to make sure that you're achieving the bitterness units that you're trying to achieve through your beer. Yeah, we go back to this idea of quality of bitterness, but that's like a whole nother episode. <laughs> sure, yeah. That's a little bit too inside baseball for, for our purposes today. Um, but then as you move through your boil, um, if you have a late addition hop uh, uh, hop charge at the very end of your boil, like say maybe um, the last 10 minutes or the, um, the last five minutes of your boil, um, you're not 
you're, you are going to be getting some bitterness from that, especially because your beer is not going to be, um, your wort is not going to be cold the minute that your boil starts. So you're getting some isomerization carryover through the end of your boil and then through the amount of time that it's being whirlpooled or being cooled in. But you're also getting um, flavor, which is the next really important part uh, of hops being added to beer. Um, and so flavor is a little bit more nebulous than bitterness because bitterness, you have a number. You have alpha acids and you can do a, um, uh, you can do a lab test at the end of your, um, when your beer is done and you can say, look, this has this number of bitterness units in it. But flavor, we start to get into the qualitative. So uh, now we're getting into a little bit more of the nebulous cloud. So flavor, uh, the way that at least we, we make beers, um, almost uh, many of the beers that we make, we have a bitterness addition at the very beginning. Um, some beers will have uh, a another addition right at the end of the boil, maybe the last 10 minutes of the boil. Um, but most of our uh, beers have a whirlpool addition. So boil uh, our beers uh, in particular have an 80 minute boil, and then they um, they get pushed into the whirlpool, and that's where we're um, we're adding another really big charge of hops to get um, flavor and aroma into the batch because it's going to be sitting on um, not quite boiling wort for about a half an hour to 45 minutes as it's um, resting for a little bit of time and then getting cooled into the tank. And then from that point, um, the other major important addition um, for most breweries, especially for ours, is a dry hop addition. And that is going to be a... Um, uh, uh, an addition of hops on what's the cold side. So everything up to the point where you have your um, wort being cooled down is hot side of the brewery. And then cold side is as soon as you cool that down and add it to the fermenter. Um, so for us, um, we typically dry hop on day seven. We will, um, for most of our beers, um, and this is, a, this is a rule of thumb, take it with a grain of salt. Everybody's doing everything completely crazy and upside down world these days. But um, typically we would be uh, removing the yeast from the batch of beer, either using that yeast for another batch of beer or dumping it down the drain. Um, and then we're adding our hops and then uh, beer is going to sit on those hops for another five days for us. Gets crash cooled at the end of the five days and then um, uh, usually try to keep it cool for two or three days. And then that beer is going to be, um, and this is for ales, uh, like I said, rule of thumbs. Um, and then after those three days of chilling, beer goes for us goes through a centrifuge and then is going to get ready to uh, get packaged after that. But that dry hop addition um, is where almost uh, where the really big overwhelming aromas are coming from because we're dumping in, um, in some cases, a pound per barrel or in some cases, much more than that, two or three pounds per barrel of hops to a tank and then sealing it. And so all of those aromas are being um kept in the tank and not being stripped out as much as possible. And I feel like Stan has a couple things to add. But the, um, it, 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 actually my first question for you is when you said you removed the yeast, so there's still yeast present when you're dry hopping? Um, well, the beer, uh, the yeast is removed in as much as it's not going through a separator, it's not getting filtered or centrifuged, but the majority of the yeast is being removed. Um, the, the bulk of these that we would use for either pitching another tank um, or in, uh, re removing as much as the yeast will come out on its own without using any kind of mechanical separation. So, so there, there is still yeast present. So you have yeast interacting with, with the hop count. There definitely the is, which... There's definitely still yeast in suspension. Um, no matter, I think no matter how flocculent your yeast is, you're still, there's still yeast in the tank. It's not completely yeast free. We're not mechanically separating the yeast from the beer at that point. Yeah. So, so this is something that people are just beginning to explore. And that's the role of the interaction of yeast with these odor compounds uh, in the hops to create different odor compounds. And, and that's what's ultimately driving, uh, you can be excited to, to uh, Shrub mosaic hops, for instance, that's that that's a hop variety. Or citra, I think you guys buy a little bit of citra. We, we go um, through quite a bit of citra. Yes. You know, what 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 does citra bring to the party? Um, you know what what happens with citra? It's not just what what if you were to just throw citra into a finished beer, 
uh, you're not going to get as much as you do out of Citra when it interacts with yeast, when it is allowed to spend some time uh, in contact with both the wort and the yeast. And, and that's uh, uh, the exciting thing that people are exploring right now. Yeah, and, um, and then is now um, with uh, this explosion of uh, people making um, what are being referred to as New England style IPAs, um, a lot of the, uh, the, the old rules, which is a laugh uh, when you consider how young our industry segment is, um, those rules are kind of going out the window and people are making beers that are partially dry hopped on maybe like day three. And then there's an additional dry hopping happening um, on day five or day seven. Day, uh, day five or day seven, and um, um, whereas once upon a time it would be insane to serve uh, somebody a beer that looks like a milkshake, um, now people are doing all kinds of different things to um, throw permanent haze into a beer, including dry hopping early to get um, yeast and hop interactions that create a permanent haze and to change mouthfeel. And there's a long list of things that um, uh, from a scientific point of view, I don't think we've even explored exactly what is happening. Um, but, um, but don't, I mean, don't let that stop you from getting out over the end of your skis. We, we need to make cloudy beer and we need to make it now. Um, yeah. but, um, now, um I, I, I think the parts are, is maybe we don't have to be out over the end of our skis. Um, because the question is that if, if you want those aromas and flavors, can you do that and still make it be? That's kind of a different discussion. As somebody who's here as a defender of the hop, I think it's important not to blame but ugly beers on the hops. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, it's just a, it's such a viscerally um, different, or it's such a different way of making beer. It makes me react viscerally rather than, um, and, uh, being able to step back and uh, m maybe appreciate it for what it is, um, I'm still I'm still not quite there yet. So, uh. but I, I'm I'm in favor of stepping back. You, you you should appreciate people are making an effort to bring these different aromas and flavors to the beer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are great opportunities there, and, and science is going to let us understand these more. Uh, to say that there are these various parts of hops instead of saying. Okay, Citra has this magic, uh, but other hops, if you put them together, might be able to do the same thing. And from this, if you view brewing as something of uh, art, or at least an artisanal effort, then you can say, oh, I can do this, I can do this, and maybe create this other um, mythic, ultimately what people refer to as flavor, without simply saying, I just, I'm going to go out and buy the hop. Yeah, uh, I think um, getting to the end point um, with maybe having something that looks a little bit more appetizing, I think is, is my main um, my main beef with the with that. But uh, I, I, I'm fine. I, I, there, there is Hefeweizen is a beautiful beer. Mm -hmm. And it does not look like yeast poured out of no fermentation it, it shouldn't at least so um so we've uh so we touched a little bit about um bittering we've touched a little bit about a, a flavor um should we get into aroma because this is a really big <laughs> really big part um yeah uh what what would you like to say to start out start us on aroma at least well but you know what so if, if you go back for the first few thousand years that people made beer um what they appreciated was aroma so so uh, hop hops have been around about five million years um a million years ago uh so well before they were used in beer um they matriculated from they originated in mongolia which is china um and they migrated across the european continent um another branch perhaps five hundred thousand later years later came into the North American continent. They are genetically different. Um, and what was considered classically great aroma was what you had in Europe. There are some key differences between those European varieties 
and the American varieties. American varieties are rasher. They're bigger, they're bolder. You know, we can talk, talk about the, the parts of the compounds that are in there, but there, there are some key differences in the compounds. So they're more in your face and they are, they are creating these other, but, but you can soften them up. So then you can get tropical fruit. You can bust your ass all day. If you use only hops of European heritage, you will never get that luscious guava, um, tropical flavor and aroma that you can get when, when you get a cross between a European variety, which brings great quality to it as well and the American variety. So it's when those those two varieties came together is when, when you get a creation of, of hops people are excited about. And um, in um, traditional brewing terms, um, we would discuss um, noble hops uh, as the ones, uh, what are, are there, there are five noble hops, right? Maybe you can... Uh, but, well, I, I think a tricky thing is, first of all, it's not too traditional because the noble hop, the term noble hop was actually invented in the 1980s by people selling hops. Well, I was only born in 1983. Um, so, I mean, that <laughs> yeah, so you, that, that's your entire lifetime. Um, so so I, I, I think a good way to talk about it is land and race varieties. Um, and the land race varieties, actually, we, we can look at the way they're genetically linked. So those uh, include Fuggle and Gold. Holding out of uh, United Kingdom, um, Sazer type hops, and Sazer type hops include Saz, Tetnanger, Spalt, um, then Hersbrucker, and Crystal Spalt, um, and, and then of course other Sazer type hops, which are like Lublin out of Poland. And those are ones that persist today. Um, so if you're excited about Sterian Golding, this, we do not need to go down this rabbit hole. I apologize. <laughs> um, but if you talk about Sterian Golding, Sterian Golding is really a fuggle. Um, and so we can go back to fuggle in, in the United Kingdom and say that's what it is. So th those hops have, uh, um, they, they are, they, they will never offend you. You can have them over for tea at four o'clock in the afternoon and they will be perfectly polite um and so yeah uh those varieties um so yeah for, those are varieties that have been cultivated for um i i, I don't hundreds know of years. hundreds of years um whereas um the hops that grew um essentially natively in north america um for many brewers traditionally were so offensive that they were never used or never crossbred into breeding programs until, um, I don't know, when, the 60s or the 70s? When, when did... Well, they actually begin... Okay, so the first, the first breeding program uh, begins at, at Y College um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And there, E.S. Salmon uh, recognizes that he wants to bring in something different. So he gets a wild hop from North America. And, and that will give them a hop with, with more alpha that people wanted was more alpha. Um, and therefore, we give it more bittering quality. They only wanted to use it for bittering. They did not like that aroma. They referred to it as Manitoba because it came out of Manitoba or American Tang. Um, and it, it was offensive. Um, it smelled of ribes, uh, and, and and people simply did not care for it. But they would use that hop at the beginning of the boil because it's better for bitterness. And um, ribes are like a black currant kind of a character, right? Black currant. Yeah, exactly. which is very interesting because that would um, I think black currant is often um, associated with Damascanone which is a specific hop characteristic, which in many modern hop varieties is, um, could be very sought out or could make a very interesting um, hop profile. Uh, and it's, right. it's, it's always so interesting to see what is um, desirable at one point in history at, versus what is not desirable in other parts of history. Um, the one thing I wanted to touch on before we go too far is, so you have these um, land race varieties from the continent. You have um, the American varieties. Where does um, uh, that uh, New Mexico, Neo-Mexicanus variety fall in uh, on that scale? 
uh, or New Mexico or that are, or, well, that they're, they're, those are the North American hops. So you're backing up to what would be the family of that Manitoba hop that was crossed okay. um, with English, either a Fuggler or a Golding. Um, because that um, that is a super drought tolerant um, variety. I mean, the stuff that they have found growing now in the desert southwest, um, you have these wild hops growing. And hops grow, I mean, they still grow all over the world. Um, I remember even uh, when we were in Tuscany five years ago, there are hops what? growing all over gardens and fence rows, and they're just wild. They're nothing that you would... Um, uh, you know, I don't know where they came from originally, if they were cultivated and they spread or if they just happened to be there. But you still, if you look for them, you can find hops growing all over the place, um, not for, uh, you know, um, growing agricultural purposes, but they're, they're just there. They exist. They're a, a hardy rhizome in, in some respects. Uh, but that um, but those characters from the North American varieties um and we'll get into this a little bit, uh, I think, in a little bit. But the the holy grail right now for breeders. So here, let's actually let's take one step back. So there's dozens and dozens of hop varieties that are available to um, to growers and to brewers right now, and they're growing all over the world. And all kinds of different hops have different characteristics. But to bring a new hop to market is a uh, an epic endeavor because um, the way that things are done now, typically, or they have been done for the last I don't I don't know how many years. You you take um, uh, you take two hot plants and you make a cross, but in order to uh, to hedge your bets, you're making tens of thousands of crosses because you're trying to get um, hops that are resistant to um, all kinds of different pressures, whether that be um, mites, whether that be mildew, whether that be drought resistance, there's all kinds of different things that they're bred for. So they, they, they make t thousands and thousands of crosses. They stress them to see what does well, and they expose them to these different um, pressures to see what is going to get out of those steps. And that's a couple of years of, of testing. And then from that point, um, they start to uh, try to grow them in the fields and see what what happens well and if it's agronomically um, re uh, realistic, if the cone is a good quality, how many cones there are on a plant, how dense they grow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if it can get past that point, then they start looking at alpha and flavor and aroma. And at that point, you're already six to eight years in. You're not even to the point where like, oh, this might be something that somebody wants to use in a beer. It's just, we've done all this work just to see if we can grow this because Growers are not going to plant or grow some variety, no matter what it smells like, if they can't make money off of it. They have to harvest a certain amount of bales per acre. So they go through all of these different steps, thousands and thousands of crosses, all of these distant tests. And then they start worrying about, um, does this smell nice? Does this have high alpha? Um, because the, the, the thing that you hear from many growers is you don't want to fall in love with a hop until you... Are allowed to fall in love with it right uh you don't want to fall in love it you, doesn't matter if it smells nice if it's not agronomically sound it's it's garbage so they go through all this work um and then when you get to year eight nine ten and you start growing them in larger quantities if they are promising um then you get closer to finally bringing that to market and letting brewers play with them and and see if it's something that they're going to want to buy so this is a crazy long process you're you're looking at nine or ten years to come up with a viable new variety um and that's adding on to this huge long portfolio of whatever brewers already have available to them and what they're looking for so the holy grail is getting into the genetics all of this and figuring out if they can get the markers for um, assigning DNA to what are the desirable properties for all these different hops. And then if you get even farther down the road, um, getting to what DNA is coming up with what flavors and what aromas so that you can get to this magical um, world of like bespoke hops where you can breed a hop or you can hit specific genetic markers to hopefully get a hop that produces certain very specific qualities. Um, so we're not there yet, 
but all the breeders that um, I've been talking to in the last couple of years are working towards this, but it's a massive undertaking to try to, um, to try to associate DNA markers with um, positive characteristics and then, you know, going down that road. Uh, I, I think a good example, of course, this is before DNA markers, um, would be looking at Citra. Um, it, because the, the cross for Citra was actually, the, the Citra itself ends up um, coming out in 1990 after the cross. And it's, and, and importantly enough, uh, middle through is the mother. So that's a European hop variety. Um, it's also uh, 25% Fogel, another European variety. It also has East Kent Golding in it. Um, it has, uh, I think, 17% Brewer's Gold. Gold, that's an American, but that's half American. And it has 3% Unknown, which is American. So it is mostly of that European background. But the important thing is um, a, a very large brewery um, paid... Uh, at the time, John Haas Farms, which is Haas. And Haas, real quick, um, um, is one of the largest growers. Well, not, not one of the largest growers, but they're one of the largest hop companies in the world. Uh, and they, Bar Barth Haas is the largest hop vendor in the world. Yeah, certainly the largest oh. vendor. They do their own growing, but they are also a really big broker, buying hops from all across the world right. um, to sell uh, to different people. So go ahead. Right. So so they, they do this work for... Um, for a brewery, and, and they come up with 50 varieties. They do test varieties, um, and ultimately, the brewery decides they don't want the hop. So Gene Probosco, who did, did, uh, did the cross, says, I think this is a really nice hop, and he keeps it going on the side. Uh, probably a few hills is all, and a hill, hill is literally uh, a few rhizomes going up one set of strength. Um, so a few years later, another large brewery comes to him and says, we're interested in coming up with something that's a unique aroma. And he says, I have just the thing for you. So they try this hop out, they do test batches, um, and once again, they reject it. So this hop is now rejected two times. Um, and so Gene Probosco is heading to a, a convention for uh, chemist and growers with Pat Ting, who was the chemist at, at the time, Miller Brewing, uh, which eventually became Miller Coors, and then, or, yeah, that, that was, it was Miller, then bought by SAB, then with Miller Coors, and so on, is now Wilson Coors, because they split from um, <laughs> when API was bought out. So it's very confusing to track that, but anyway, he's working for this major thing he's done is he was really behind uh, Miller making beer with no raw hops at all, using only extract through the entire process. So he is a pure scientist, but he's a scientist who loves aroma. So he, he says to Dean Pasco, we're looking for something with a unique citrus quality. Do you have anything that will work for us? And and Dean says, I have this the hop for you. And by then, he has like seven hills of it. So they try this out, and they do a bunch of test batches. Um, so at uh, in Milwaukee, uh, Miller, well, Miller Coors has a pilot brewery for their pilot brewery, this really tiny system. And so they would make these only literally several gallons of beer. In Pat Ting, they're making basically a double IPA for this guy. And he really loves this hop. We test them throughout the process. And eventually, Miller says, it's good. We can't imagine a product this work in. <laughs> By now, it is 15 years later from the first time this hop has been read. But he's rejected throughout the process. Um, and they begin putting it in the hands of a few brewers, including Widmer. So Widmer in 2008 in the World Beer Cup with their pale ale, which at the time was called like X, and I because it's saying it several different numbers through its life, like it's one away. They win a gold medal in the beer cup LAL. And at this point, uh, Deschutes, Sierra Nevada, and Widmer now fund growing this out to a larger amount. And it's released in 
house deep and it becomes an overnight success. Of course, that's 18 years. Never originally, people say, this is the old one now. Now, of course, what everybody wants now is Citra. Or, or some other <laughs> variant time, of... Time after time. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing is true of, of Cascade. Cascade, uh, the cross for Cascade was made in 1955. Cascade was released in 1972 pretty much by accident. People thought it would be a replacement of the old plops. From, by 1976, the acres were way up. Between 1976 and 1988, the acres went down every single week. Um, and Cascade could have gone away, and now it's a classic aroma. That's how much the world has changed and what we expect from us. Yeah, it's a it's a long, long straight trip on some of these varieties. But yeah. It is one of the highlights of my year when I get to go out to the growers and ex go through their experimental fields because they are typically of the the, the three or four big um, growers um, that have breeding programs out in Yakima. They usually have somewhere between five to ten varieties that they have that are um, close to graduating to that next step of let's see if this is something that might be commercially viable. So every year you get to go out and they'll put out either they'll have samples for you or you'll get to walk through the field um, depending on when you're there and when the hops are ready um, and you'll get to walk through and see these different um, uh, hops that sometimes have insanely beautiful characteristics. Um, one year I remember rubbing a hop that was like a purple grape drink like it was so strongly like big league chew purple grapes that you would not you you thought that somebody had chewing gum and and crushed it in with the hops and then a couple um varieties over i rubbed a hop that was the like the purest cleanest parmigiano reggiano that i don't know what you would ever use in a beer but it wasn't cheesy like old oxidized hops or anything like that it was like a really beautiful clean parmesan umami kind of characteristic and the variety that you can get from hops is just mind-blowing and so now um i think what you're seeing a lot of the stuff that's being bred and being presented right now are in those similar veins of tropical fruity um some type of um um i, I don't know marriage of different tropical or or hoppy you know something in that family of um, of mango or coconut or vanilla or something that's bringing out those characteristics. Those are, seem to be the varieties that many brewers are interested in. Um, one that we rubbed this year, excuse me, it took um, my coworker and I a while to put our fingers on what we were getting, but we ultimately decided on um, a cedar chest that had had leather in it for a long time. And that sounds like a really unusual way to describe a hop, but it ended up being almost precisely what we were smelling. And it wasn't negative in any way. It was very pleasant. Um, and there is one hop compound that has um, those types of characteristics to it. And the grower told us that, yes, this one has a really high volume of that character of that chemical compound in it. So it's really cool when you get to see those kind of things. And it's, I mean, uh, it, it, it might, it's, I guess it, it's not super, super surprising because hops are, um, are related to cannabis, right? They're in the, are in the cannabis family. And the variety that you can get from those plants, obviously, is incredibly huge, too. So the, the compounds that are in there are, 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 are really, really interesting. It's getting the plant to express it is the, is the difficult part. And then the other important part thing is, so aroma... Um, we, we talked about harvest, so um, Shoot had asked earlier when plants become mature, and this is a very um, uh, important point because when you get to alpha, you're just, you can grab those hops towards the end of the harvest season, you can do tests, you can say the oils are this number, the alpha acids are this number, we know we need to harvest during this certain amount of time, um, and aroma is almost not um, even a second thought when it comes to alpha hops. Most of them are going to have a, <clears throat> a really strong um, onion, garlic, diesel character to them because they are left on for so long because they're trying to get those oils to develop. 
when it comes to um, aroma varieties, the time when they are picked is crucial because it's a really small window in most cases. And um, once you go past um, that ideal characteristic for that one hop, it starts to bleed into that onion garlic characteristic. And then you've just spent an entire growing season growing an aroma hop that does not have a pleasant aroma. Right. Well, I, I think an example is not a U.S. hop, uh, but it's Nelson Sauvin from New Zealand, mm -hmm. which is that, that, that's basically the most expensive hop in the world right now. Um, it, it's really hard to get. Um, and so when it shows up at Lupulin Exchange, which is a, which is a website where people trade hops, uh, it'll bump if somebody puts a small amount out there at 30 to 35 dollars per pound, it'll be scooped up almost immediately. Um, New Zealand is it's now that almost half their production is Nelson Sauvin, which is really hard because what we haven't talked about, even if, if when you showed that picture from Peralt, uh, you go into the Peralt facility, which is actually a picker side by side, and it's 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 the size of a high school gymnasium, a decent size high school gymnasium with just hop pickers in it, um, and it's it's it is gigantic, and it makes you how hard it. It, it, you begin to realize what a small window you have to process these things. It's very expensive to build a hop picker. Those side-by-side -side hop pickers at Brawl Farms are both more than a million dollars a piece, and you get to use them four to six weeks out of the year. So in New Zealand, for them to pick all the hops in New Zealand, it becomes very compressed. Nelson Sauvin needs to be picked inside of six uh, and that's the hard thing to get the maximum out of that hop. So that's that's really what it, it comes down to. Uh, agriculture is still a gigantic factor in all of this. Let me see if I can uh, track down my pictures from that year that I took those uh, at Peralt. I'm trying to remember what year I was out there that I saw those because the year that I was there, um, it was actually they were um, a new. Uh, it was I think it had, might have just gone in that. Fall. New in fifteen. I, I, think. I think so. Yeah. Let me uh, let me try to find my photos from that year. Um, but yeah, it is a super um, super impressive facility, and I think it is right here. Let me see if I can get that to come up. So uh, this is a um, an a forklift or an end loader um, pushing hops into that cutter. Do I have one that is a little bit of a step back? This is a this is a single picker, or, or uh, I don't think this one was a side by side. And maybe so maybe I'm at a different you, farm you, here. No, I think this is it. Yeah, this is it. That, but I, that'd be part. So that's okay. That so you take that times two, mm -hmm. and they can process there, uh, which they're doing over the course of about six, six weeks. The same amount of hops that New Zealand, all of New Zealand does. Um, they process more hops there than all the Nelson Sauvin in the world. And they're yeah. doing this over the course of a month. In the case of Nelson Sauvin, they've got six days. We can, um, yeah, so we can see this a little it, bit it, side by side right here. Yeah, there there you begin to see a little bit of this type of it's a, it, it is massive, um, but it's also not super efficient. Uh, in, in terms of use throughout the year. Yeah, and then the other important thing is that um, the, the, we uh, spoke a lot about rule of thumbs, but, um, the amount of acreage that's being put in, in Yakima right now is crazy. And nearly every, about 5,000 acres that gets put in needs another picker and processing facility to go through all that. Um, because everything is so time sensitive. You can't just take it to your existing facility because you already have acreage taking up, um, that picker. So if you want, um, uh, if you want extra acreage, you need to invest in all of this capital for, for everything else. And so, um, like we had mentioned before, hops are being grown in more places now. Um, like we said, there's a lot of hops in Michigan. But I could not tell you how many emails we get from a mom and pop farmer in southern Indiana or some other um, some other part of the country that says, I'm thinking about growing hops. What do you want to buy? And um, we generally politely tell them we are not interested because even if they grow the most gorgeous hop in the world, 
they, they, there's no way that they can invest the capital into processing um, those hops in their extremely small setting. And there's very little chance that even if they grow a super nice hop, that it's going to get to us in a usable form that's representative of that what it was in the field. Um, and so it's it's a it, it's an extremely difficult business to break into, and um, uh, you you really have to do your uh, your numbers before you dedicate yourself to it. Let me see if there's anything else. But yeah, when you go to Peralt. Um, I've heard a number of people describe it as the essentially like the Disneyland of hot processing mm -hmm. because they um, they they really have a beautiful facility and uh, they spend a lot of money on things. But um, so uh, let's get actually um, we've talked a little bit about hop compounds and I know you have a couple slides. Maybe we should get into the slides. Sure. Um, so we have uh, let's see. Did you want to start with hop oil? Yeah, be good. Okay. And I'll go full screen on this. So here we go. So um, uh, so this chart, are, these are some slides um, that uh, Stan uh, shared with me. And let me see if I can change the, I think we've, I'm missing a little bit of the picture on there, but let me, let me edit. Well, that, that's all right. I could, real quickly, when, when people in the past, um, so, so of, of the hop oils, um, a very large percentage of the hop oils are hydrocarbons, which oil up almost immediately. Um, more recently, there's been more focus on the oxygenated compounds, um, which can be up to, say, 30%. And then in just the last few years, less than 10 years, be, beginning to look at those sulfur compounds over on uh, what would be the uh, audience right, mm -hmm. um, which are, are only less than 1% of the hop oil. So an important thing about the hop oils, when you think about, uh, over time, we, we talked about the land race hops. For the land race hops, say a Kent Golding or a Sazer hop, are going to have between one half percent to 1% of the hop will be hop oil. Uh, more recently, when we have these new varieties, uh, which are bred and also have an American background to them, say uh, Hopsteiner's Eureka, which is a new hop from them, that can be up to 4% oil. So it, it can have four, uh, four to eight times uh, the amount of oil than, say, a Sazer has. So a lot of um, brewers are just looking at the pure how much oil does it have? That's all they want. They're asking, how much oil does it have? Um, but some research at Oregon State University, which is totally the cutting edge of hop research in the world, basically, uh, they go to the other part, which you need to understand what the quality of the oil is as well. So I'm just saying something that makes it a little bit more complicated. So I, I, to walk through real quick, like because I can talk like seven hours about this, um, <laughs> is beginning to understand people were focused on the oxygenated compounds. Um, so uh, when, when Citra first became popular, uh, researchers at Sapporo in Sapporo Brewing in, in Japan, which recently became the owner of Anchor Brewing in San Francisco, as a matter of fact, um, they looked and they said, they, lo they looked at, at the makeup of, of the oil compounds in, in citra and said it's really high in little oil and geranium. What else do we know that's really high in little oil and geranium? Well, as a matter of fact, coriander is. So they conducted experiments with coriander, placing the hops that they would use in a beer with coriander, and then they compared the two. And, and what happens is you take those two compounds together, linalool and geranial, you put them together during the brewing process, so they are interacting with yeast, and they create another compound. That compound is now citron LL, which can be found in hops, but at very low levels. You create more citron LL, that's, it, it gives you no surprising. If, if, you, if you grow, for instance, up for garden citron LL plants, 
which you can take those leaves and rub them on yourselves and uh, you will not smell like beer or a hop and it will kill mosquitoes away. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a really citrus smelling. So it, it created more of a, a little bit of a lime quality and it began to give you some of that same character as, as uh, the citra hop did. It also gives you a lot of coriander flavor. So that's kind of the downside. So it can smell a little like the hops, but it's still so sensitive to that coriander, which in itself, if you're sensitive to that, and it is one of the most divisive aromas there's going. Uh, I happen to be among people who are sensitive to uh, coriander. As, so as me, the, I, you're the, you don't like, you don't like cilantro, don't like coriander? Um, I do in, in that lower level. I love Allagash White. Okay. But when it's overdone, then it, to me, it goes to celery and ham. <laughs> but we we could be on the verge of making a beer that keeps the mosquitoes away, I think is what you're trying to get to, right? <laughs> no, but I, I actually wasn't worried about soup. I should be because I I get bit all the time. By, and, and sometimes I, I can rub citra. Apparently, me and citron LL does not work with mosquitoes, okay. as a matter of fact. I can walk in from the evening and I smell totally uh, like a citra hop and I still will get up the next morning and have bites all over. <laughs> so, so they uh, continued this research at, at Sapporo and they began to identify other um, hops that are were either high in geranial or linalool. Um, and and uh, unfortunately they did, they did this research after um for the love of hops came out. I would love to say this was in the book, but it's not. That, the, the discussion of hop oils, like you see here, is uh, and and research they did with coriander, um, but particularly talking mostly to, to home brewers um, and occasionally to commercial brewers as well, beginning to advocate what happens if um, you take a hop that's high in little, uh, like the nugget hop, and a hop. It is high in geranial, like Chinook, and you use both of those uh, in the whirlpool. So you retain most of that oil quality. You let them interact with yeast, and you see what you get. You are not going to get citra, but you get a, a different, unique, uh, fruity quality that heads towards tropical. And this is all based upon the research coming out of Sephora. Um, what, what they... Uh, taken a look at more recently of course so if you want to go to that that other that next slide i showed you sure. i sent you um so it'll we'll take us i got that so this is slide. a this is a spider so, chart of um bravo cascade citra and mosaic correct and just real quick um if you've never seen a spider chart um this is a uh graphical representation of um evaluating a hop um it can be uh in this case it is um uh, uh, qualitative data, right? So um, somebody's sitting down and rubbing these hops, and they're saying it has. Yeah, th th this is actually hops used in beer. Okay, so um, uh, but this is uh, okay. So this is people evaluating uh, single hot beers. Correct. Okay, so these are people evaluating single hot beers, and then assigning values to how much this beer is flowery, how much of it is fruity, how much of it is citrus, tropical, green, sulfur. Um, brewed with a single hop in these four instances. Right. So so you can look at those instances, for instance, and, and we have Citra and Mosaic, um, and you can compare compare those to Bravo, for instance. And Bravo is higher in linalool than the Mosaic. It's higher in Citronello than the Mosaic, and it's higher than Geranial than the Mosaic. Yet, it's not nearly as tropical. So you begin to ask yourself, what else is going on? What's the other factor taking place? And 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 this is where, you know this is the most recent research out of Sapporo. So they're saying you know there's this other factor. So you know what's working for if if I suggest to home brewers that you use the Nugget and Chinook and you hope that they are higher in, in geranial and in the Nugget in uh, little 
the Chinook and Geraniol, of course, these can vary from year to year. They can vary where they are grown. They vary upon when they are harvested. But if you get them with those higher compounds and, you, and these things happen, you're going, how come I got to tropical? Yet, if I look at the hops that are high in that, what is the difference? Well, the other wild card here is the, or the thiols or the sulfur compounds. So these thiols and sulfur compounds are going to be less than 1% of the oil. So we're talking about 1% of 2%, but they also have super low uh, thresholds of perception. So it takes only a little bit. So you can see in this next slide, but yeah, you can go <clears throat> that third slide. Yep, right here. So we, yep. we have um, it'll take it. Uh, four MSP LGC mix right. and four MSP plus LGC mix. Yeah. So at LGC mix is linalool, geraniol, citronella. So in this case, what they've done is they've taken those compounds. These are not with hops. This is taking a work, spiking it with the particular compounds. So an ex so a chemically go. extracted compound from something. So they're, right. they're fractioning that out um, in right. a lab, essentially. Yeah. So you can take it when you take 4-MSP, which, which is a compound, which is also known as 4-MMP. It, it's a prominent compound, which is super important for um, Sauvignon Blanc. People have always understood that with Sauvignon Blanc. So the... So, um, you know, uh, vintners have been looking for 4-MMP. They begin to understand they also needed oxygenated compounds like little little and geranium to get to that best Sauvignon Blanc character. In the case of brewers, they've looked for that LGC mix and now are beginning to understand it's the interaction with 4-MMP. So you can look at the difference when you put the 4-MMP together with the LGC, then look what happens to tropical. Yeah, it's, it's maxed out on the chart. Yeah, so, so you know, in further research, different researchers at Sapporo, and you go, man, those Japanese are way ahead of us, and they are. <laughs> um, that they've taken the same combination, which is they've taken 13 oxygenated compounds and three sulfur compounds recompose those and when they pull the three sulfur compounds out you lose uh about 40 percent of the tropical character as a matter of fact so as we begin to understand saying okay i've got hops that are high in this high in this high in this it it will just give brewers a better idea of how to blend yeah and that's really interesting too because um this year um when we were when i went off our selection one of our um, purveyors actually gave us um, GC or gas chromatograph uh, or GCMS or however you prefer to think of it, um, uh, detailed chemical composition um, of the specific lots for the variety that we were choosing. So uh, on top of seeing um, all of those um, different cuts in front of you, um, you also, so you do your rub, you go through it however you choose to evaluate your hop lots. Um, but then you also have all this additional information that you never had before um, to make your selection. And um, in our case, we didn't use it to make our selection, um, especially because ultimately, you know, it, it's got to smell and, and, and be nice. Uh, you can't, I don't think you can tell that now yet entirely just from looking at a, a couple GC compounds. But the lot that we did choose um, for this one variety had a big spike in one chemical compound that we were able to say, you know, this one, this lot, there's something about this lot that's really nice. I can't exactly put my finger on it, but when we went back and looked at the GC information, there was a really big spike in this one chemical compound that we decided to say, you know what, it's probably that, that is why we like it. Um, and it's just cool to have that information right in front of you, whether or not we were attributing the right chemical compound to what we were getting or not. Um, it was very interesting. And I, and I assume that more people are going or more um, hop companies are going to be offering that. Um, the trouble is it's probably an insane amount of work to get all that stuff going um, because harvest already is an insane time. And then having your lab kick out 
hundreds and hundreds of different GC specs for different hoplots. Um, it's probably not super um, realistic for a lot of companies, but it's something there and it could be a super powerful tool. And back, back to what you talked about at, at the outset, um, that perhaps um, at this point, some, some brewers have uh, overcommitted to the amount of hops they're going to grow, mm -hmm. uh, at, 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 at the amount that they are going to buy. They contracted higher than that. Um, and it makes you realize that if you want to sell hops, it is hyper competitive and that people are going to have to provide you this information. Once somebody provides it to you. Um, yeah, the, flood, then... the floodgates are open. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I thought so that was I thought that was so super cool. So um, so we touched yeah. on it a little bit. So um, uh, uh, we dove pretty deep there into aroma. Um, let's take a step back. Uh, hops are an agricultural product. Um, maybe you can fill us in a little bit about what the current status of hops being grown in the U.S. and then hops being grown worldwide is. Um, we mentioned that in 2007 there was a uh, there was an enormous alpha shortage, um, and that had uh, I think trickle down effects um, is being a, a pretty putting it lightly uh, for a lot of brewers. But where where is the um, where is the hop market worldwide right now? What are we seeing? Well, I it, there you you have a connection to, to people growing hops and understanding what brewers want and what consumers want more than they ever have before. Um, they, you know, you grew the hops here, it was almost isolated. Um, and that connection is great. Uh, it, I think a lot of hop farmers, growers, see this opportunity. Um, is, is the demand for these sort of beers gonna be there? That's, that is the question everybody is asking now. Uh, on a short-term basis, we we probably got too much. The, the ability, uh, were capacities to, uh, you know, that we're, we've, we've grown out more acres than we're going to need in the next year. Probably not as many as we need in the next five years. So what you hope is that people don't go out of business waiting for to cancel. There's a lot of aroma acreage going in in Yakima um, in the last two years, and then going forward for this year, um, I've I've just heard a lot of people putting in. You know, there's thousands of acres going in right now. So, uh, and and some of that is taking out certain varieties and putting in new varieties. Um, last year, uh, specifically, um, seed count is a, um, uh, a parameter that you typically get with your lot analysis when you're making your choices at selection. And you don't want to have um, a large percentage of seeds in your hops because you're not buying seeds, you're buying hops. Um, but hops produce seeds when there is a male plant um, in the field. And um, in Oregon, because they have, I guess the explanation that I've always heard is because there's so many wild hops growing around, um, the the agricultural hop growing areas of Oregon, they have a really high seed count. Um, last year, seed counts overall were very high because there was a lot of baby acres in. And when you have those baby acres in, sometimes you'll have some males in there and that ends up throwing the seed count up much higher. But um, uh, last year, or uh, I think it was last year, it might have been the year before, we rubbed a hop uh, a lot from Oregon, and they were gorgeous. They smelled amazing, but there were so much seeds that it felt gritty, like you could feel it in your hands, like there were little bits of gravel in there. Um, and so ultimately, we didn't choose that lot. But um, uh, one of the things that you'll see when they do all of this acreage switchover um, is that the seed count will creep up for a year because there's so many new um, plants going in and you get some males in there that they have to the weed out, but usually it's too late by the time they, I mean, you don't find out they're males until they flower. So.
Oh, I keep waiting for you to step in, Stan. Sorry, I didn't want to oh, step. No, I didn't want to step on. I thought you were going to say something. Oh no! I, well, that, the the curious part that uh, about that, of course, is is then because almost everything's going to pellets, um, is the ability to uh, siphon the seeds out. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there, there's a there's many ways to skin a cat. Uh, right. I guess I, I think it's just intuitively it seems. Um, uh, it seems like you don't want to you don't want to pay for two percent of what you're buying being seeds. Well, no, because you're buying wheat. Sure, that's um, yeah. But, but but if you're if if you're buying them in this process, that's that's not so much an issue. But the but the other part is what you worry about is when you have that many male plants around, is uh, is that entire field going to be true to type? Sure. Yeah, it's not merely the fact that you have males. It's the fact that you're having wild crossbreeding happening in you, what you want to be a controlled setting. Right. So we've got lots of acreage going in. Um, what about, um, what are some things that you have been, uh, what's on your radar in terms of what's in the immediate future for hop growing and breeding? And then what is the, um, what are some of the long-term projects that you're hearing or the things that you're keeping tabs on? Well, I, I, I think, which, which I would not have thought would be possible five years ago, is this um, interest in local, local hops. Uh, so basically inefficient hops uh, outside of the Northwest. Northwest is a great place to grow hops. Um, you know, Michigan is trying to grow hops at a larger scale. But, for instance, Indiana has... Um, you know, several farms that, you know, they've got five farms who have the ability to, to uh, make pellets. Um, in, in New York, you, you've got a lot more s small farms. It, they're aided, of course, by their, their uh, farm brewery license. So brewers get a break when they, when they use New York hops. Um, but it, it really, doesn't make up for the extra expense, except if people begin to value saying this, this is, this is a flavor I like because it's a flavor that's familiar to me and a flavor that is from my region. Now, what sort of legs does that have? <laughs> I, I, I can't exactly forget. I didn't have hop terroir on the, uh, on the outline for today, but <laughs> there, there, um, there's no doubt there is hop terroir. Mm -hmm. the, the, of course, the important thing is terroir does not speak to quality. <laughs> terroir just means it tastes unique. Mm -hmm. um, but for instance, in Connecticut, um, you know, there, there's one decent sized hop, hop farm now in Connecticut. He has renamed his Cascade and Chinook hops um, to uh, Concade and Con Hook, and they are very different. They do not Chinook in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Connecticut, and probably New York. I just talked to people about that. Smells different off the vine, and it definitely brews different than Chinook from the Northwest. It has more pineapple character. It, it is giving people different aromas and flavors. Um, it is, I would say it's more nuanced. And right now, we still haven't reached the point that people, what's new and exciting is not necessarily nuanced. Mostly right now, it is cloudy and murky. Yeah, it's hard to, um, it's hard to um, make people excited about nuance, I guess. That's... <laughs> but but you, you would hope down the road that that may be true. Yeah, hopefully that can be um, financially uh a financial goal for somebody if they're doing something really unique making it not so they're they're not have to end up selling the farm because they just had a great idea instead of uh what well, i you know in in terms of uh can nuance be important I, you know i i would say that the ongoing success of the saz hop in, indicates that there's a, at least demand for uh, uh 15,000 acres of nuance yeah, that's a, that's a lot of hops, uh, um, and I'll, you know I've heard that um, Japan grows 
or buys nearly all of the Zots grown Zotzer. That it's it's difficult to f- actually get your hands on uh, Czech grown Zaz in the U.S. I mean, there, it's there, but it's not in the same. Uh, that the the large majority of it goes to Japan. Yeah, J- Japan is very demanding, and and does buy an immense amount of the size. You're correct, and and it's it's interesting. I mean, if they they just funded an immense study of figuring out what age of size plant plants uh, um, create uh, uh, generate the 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 aroma that they want. Uh, so it's you know their their willingness to spend money figuring out um, nuance is very impressive. Um, what about um, things that you have uh, things that you've heard of or things that you're keeping tabs on for uh, the the future? <laughs> well, it, 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 as you know, there's right now within the last year you've got this immense interest in lupulin powder. Um, which just allows people to pour a lot more odor compounds uh, in into their beer without putting all this other green matter. Um, where that goes, we're, we're still going to have to find out because you're, you're using uh, less than half of what is in a pellet. So what what was in that half you decided not to use? <laughs> um, and... <clears throat> the uh, lupulin powder, um, the first generation of it we used ended up, for me, being actually very difficult to work into our process um, in an efficient way. Um, but one of the companies, or maybe the only company that's selling that, told me that they are going to making a pelletized version of that. So it should be much easier to use um, for people going forward because... Yeah, there is a, the pellets are out now. Okay. I just don't know how widely. Um, for, I mean, in our limited use, I mean... Take it with a grain of salt, but I didn't. We did not see enough of a, uh, a dramatic effect to justify the extra amount of work and the the price difference. But I'm sure. I mean, people, the people that are using it that love it really love it. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it it it's it has greater value to people with the uh, that are smaller breweries that are less efficient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because um, uh, if you're yeah, if you can you know if you can get just that sweet spot out of the hop of what you're trying to get, and you can take out all the vegetative matter, then that's, yeah, that's definitely a, an important play for a lot of people. Um, how about, that's kind of it. You know, we decided not to do any beer tasting for today, um, mainly because it's, there's so many beers out there and, um, finding beers that showcase one single hot variety are, it's not super, um, easy to get a beer that's nationally available. Um, the one that I always point people to is Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Um, because if you want to find out what Cascades are about, that is the easiest, most consistent, um, delicious way to uh, get a beer that's really just a showcase for Cascade. Um, but finding two or three others um, is not necessarily that easy. And um, for many brewers, it's actually really kind of a roll of the dice to dedicate um a beer to one hop variety. Um, Bell's Two Hearted uses Centennial, and that's really, uh, they buy a ton of Centennial to make that beer, um, but that's not necessarily nationally available, so we didn't go for that. But um, the one of the issues is uh, hops are an agricultural product, and if you have a beer that is dependent on a single hop variety, if something happens to that variety, or if, um, say, for Amarillo, um, Amarillo is a hop variety that uh, when it first became commercially available, widespread, um, it had one characteristic, and because there was only one grower who didn't license it out to anybody else, um, in many people's opinions, the quality of that uh, went down over the years, or the quality changed, um, and uh, people became less dependent on it, and kind of that variety kind of got hamstrung in a lot of people's eyes. So um, it's hard to consistently make beers with a, with something as finicky as hops can be. So um, we didn't, we didn't do yeah, it. Yeah, I would say in the case, Amarillo would be really interesting uh, going forward. Uh, the parts, parts are, first of all, it does uh, come out of patent soon, and it is, it's a patented hop. Um, but right now it's also being licensed in Germany mm-hmm. and Michigan. 
So you'll begin to say, what's the difference between a, a German grown Amarillo versus a Michigan grown Amarillo versus an Idaho grown Amarillo versus um, back to uh, Toppenish, the, the, the Mosh farm is where it was found and where it was grown and grown only on that farm until 2012. There, and there is one it, other you, grower it, that I heard was there, going to be growing it in the you know, Midwest, but it's like one more than another. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you know, the other part is it's like I said, it's an agricultural product, um, right. and um, if you have something that is that specific, um, it's very, it can be somewhat dangerous to dedicate yourself to um, a variety specific characteristic, because if that character changes, then you've either got to find a way to blend hops to get that same characteristic or stop making the beer. So, so we didn't do any, but I, I, I think that, that, that's, that's how brewers, um, manage to gear that's job security for a brewer who understands how to blend hops rather than simply saying, I just go out and buy this thing. without question. And that is, um, I mean, in, in almost in every beer that we make, we have a, you know, a true to brand that we try to make every time. And, <clears throat> It's not necessarily dependent on one hop variety for most of our beers, but because all of those, uh, you know, all those flavor slider bars are changing from year to year, you've got to uh, you've got to tweak things here and there to make sure that you're still getting to the same point. Um, uh, and now I lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, but so we didn't do a beer tasting uh, mainly be, be, uh, because of that point. Um, but um, there are uh, so many beers out there. Um, uh, and it's not uncommon to find local breweries doing single hop beers. So if you do come across one of those, um, in a brew pub or a small brewery where you, they say specifically, we made this hop with only this one variety, it can be a really cool thing to sit down and, um, and to taste those beers and to get an idea of, um, putting a hop, um, you know, through the, through the different steps and seeing what it can, what it can produce. Um, let me, I will post, uh, Stan's blog, um, in chat again. Uh, AppalachianBeer.com. Um, uh, at least once a week, Stan has really great links. Um, uh, Stan is like a uh, curator of different beer websites in many respects and finds some really interesting th things to read. So if you want to start your Monday out with some really cool um, beer tidbits from around, around the web, uh, I definitely recommend checking out his website. You can also find his books there. Um, there is a lot in for the love of hops that we did not cover um, i highly recommend picking it up it's published by the brewers association um, but you can find it via his website um, or amazon or do you have a preferred vendor is there a somewhere that puts more dollars in san Hieronymus's pocket than others i i you know i'm the world's worst salesman so i'm not <laughs> sure but i always i tell people go to brewers publications and that is a publisher for the book and in and brewers publications you'll find a lot of other really useful books uh, yeah, if there's other um, if there's other books that you're interested in with um, hops specifically, um, Mitch Steele, uh, formerly of uh, Stone Brewing, wrote a great book about IPA. I also have that on my bookshelf right here. Um, and although it's not specifically about hops, um, IPA is very um, hop specific, and so there's a lot of really cool hop information in here, even though it's not uh, a book purely about hops. Um, but I I definitely recommend both of those. Um, and um so so i'll give a pitch to another book that might amuse people sure. although it's 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 not it's it's more fun reading mm -hmm. and i'll give you a feel for hops but also whatever which is uh miracle brew pete brown's new book and i think it is released in the u.s like next week Ooh. it's been out for a while it, it, it was a uh, wasn't kickstarter it was a crowdfunding thing mm -hmm. so like three years ago, we I bought the book and then eventually became was able to download it a, a few months ago. And I'll put it's a, a really fun read. Put a link. Tell you there. a lot of things about hops you might not know otherwise, and also about barley and yeast and a certain amount about water. Um, and Pete Brown is a, a really great writer as well. It it it's it's a really fun amusing read. So did Pete write the? He did a bunch of um, IPA myth busting at one point, didn't he? Well, actually, Martin Cornell did the the IPA myth busting. Okay. he's the best. Martin Cornell's the best. That's uh, but but 
but but I think Pete's written about that as well. But he also wrote Hops and Glory. He he he's the guy who who actually went to Burton on Trent, had them make a beer, and then he followed the original IPA route clear to India. I think that must have been what I was thinking of, which is a really uh, cool project. Now, of course, the keg actually blew up along the way. They had to supply him with the keg. It is a great, it's a great, great story, particularly if in the presence of his wife, who will point out quite realistically that it almost ended their marriage. But that's... <laughs> The things we do for love and beer. Yeah. Cool. Well, with that, um, Stan, thank you so much for joining uh, joining me. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm really glad that you were able to come uh, chat. I hope that you have your brains absolutely exploding with hop knowledge right now. Um, yeah. I will uh, come up with a topic for our next, next installation. Uh, let's see. This is very nearly October, but I think by the next time we do this, we'll be in October. So, um We'll have to come up with a good October-related theme. Or, pumpkin beers, pumpkin yeah, beers, I think. pumpkin beers. Thanks for your time, Stan. We got to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're definitely not doing pumpkin beers. Um, but maybe, um, Giggle, uh, maybe if you have any ideas, send me one. Um, or maybe we can go and do another beer tasting. Um, we haven't done any. We haven't done a, like an in-depth tasting for a while. Um, maybe we can get five or six beers. Maybe we could do... Um, uh quebec style belgians um one of our uh one of our buddies here in chat stan um is from quebec and uh uh has a the finger on the pulse of the quebec beer scene so um maybe we, yeah and also says he has millions of ideas so uh maybe we can schedule one in for uh for for uh next month giggle of uh, stuff that we can get um in at least that i can get here and that you can also get in quebec or maybe some more widely dis distributed uh, Quebecois beers. Um, but, um, I think that's about it for this week. Um, thanks again. And if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to, uh, send me a message and, um, I think we will, uh, I'll, I'll post, uh, I'll post information on, uh, my Twitch page, um, for when we come up with the date and when we come up for a topic for next month. So I think that's it. We'll see you guys later. Thanks again. <laughs>